Hello, this is Joe, the old stargazer, and I'd like to welcome you back to Act 5 of Looking Up, The Dog and the Unicorn. If you've not yet seen all of the earlier episodes of this program, I would recommend that you go back and watch them in order. Also, I suggest you watch these in full screen mode, as it will be easier to see some of the things I'm pointing out. This show will be all about the constellations you will see in winter. While winter nights can be cold, especially in more northern areas, if you dress properly, the winter skies can be a wonderful sight to see. In the winter, we often see far less cloudy nights, and the cold winter air can make the stars seem to come down even closer to Earth. Let's see what's up there. The first constellation I want to show you is one that a lot of people know. It's almost as well known as the Big Dipper. It's the constellation of Orion, the hunter, and it rides high in the southern sky all through the winter. To make it easy to find, I always told my audience to just look for three stars in a row, bright star above, bright star below. Once you find this pattern, locating the rest of the constellation is fairly easy. The top bright star marks the hunter's right shoulder. This star's name is, you're going to love this one, Beetlejuice. Go ahead, say it three times. You know you want to. His other shoulder is marked by the star Bellatrix. There are a few dim stars that mark his head, and the three stars all in a row, as a child I call them the three blind mice, mark the hunter's belt and are named Alnatak, Alnalam, and Mintaka. Alnatak means girdle, Mintaka means belt, and Alnalan means the bright one, because it's just slightly brighter than the other two. A sword hangs from Orion's belt. The two stars Saif and Rigel mark his knees. Above his head he holds a club, and in his left hand he holds either a bow, as some see it, or a lion skin taken from the lion Leo, which we'll talk about in the Spring Sky session. In Greek legend, Orion was another of those mortals who angered the gods by claiming that he could kill any animal that the gods had made. As punishment, the gods sent down Scorpius, the scorpion, to battle Orion. You should remember Scorpius from our Summer Sky episode. Orion and Scorpius fought for seven days and seven nights, and Orion finally managed to defeat the monster but not before Scorpius stung Orion on his foot. The gods placed both of them in the sky to honor this epic battle, but they placed them on opposite sides of the sky so they would never harm one another again. And that's why you see Scorpius in the summer sky and Orion in the winter. If you have access to a pair of binoculars, take a look at the middle of Orion's sword with them you will see a fuzzy patch of light that is clearly not just a star. This is the Orion Nebula, also called M42. We'll talk about those M designations in a later program. The nebula is a large cloud of gas and dust, an area where new stars and planets can form. That's right. Stars and planets are born in areas of space just like this one. As the gas and dust slowly pull together through gravity, eventually enough material can be collected to form a newborn star. The leftover dust collects over time to form new planets. What makes M42 interesting is that you can just barely see it with the naked eye. Through a pair of binoculars, you can see even more detail. With a simple camera and some patience and skill, you can actually get a fairly decent picture of it. I took this picture with my digital camera from my own backyard several years ago. There are better pictures of the nebula, but I like mine. Before we leave Orion, let's talk about the star Betelgeuse. This star has actually been in the news quite a bit over the last year or so because it suddenly dimmed to about one-third of its normal brightness. Astronomers all over the world became interested in the star. 
Betelgeuse is classified as a red supergiant star. This type of star usually has a violent end, exploding and blowing themselves across space in an event called a supernova. Betelgeuse will almost certainly do this one day. This type of event happens very rarely within easy viewing of Earth. When Betelgeuse does explode, the sight will be so bright that, that it will even be visible during the day. Will this happen soon? Unlikely. Will it happen within my lifetime? Eh, also unlikely. It's certainly possible it could happen soon enough for some of you to witness it, however. It will be an amazing once-in-a-lifetime event. Oh, and we haven't yet discussed how far away the stars are from us. The distances are huge beyond anything you can easily imagine. In fact, the distances are so large that astronomers use a measurement for them called a light year. A light year is not a measure of time, but a measure of distance. It is how far a beam of light can travel in a whole year. And since light travels at about 186,000 miles per second, a light year is about 6 trillion miles. That's a six, followed by 12 zeros. Betelgeuse is over 642 light years away from us. If you ever do see Betelgeuse go supernova, you will be watching an event that occurred 642 years ago. Oh, and by the way, that name Betelgeuse it means armpit of the giant. Hmm. Remember the pointer stars in the Big Dipper? Well, you can use the three stars of Orion's belt as pointers to this really bright blue star. This star's name is Sirius, and it's often called the dog star. Sirius marks the nose of Canis Major, the large dog. You can almost make out a dog in this pattern. Sirius is his nose. The triangle of stars, including Sirius, make up his head. From there, it's not too hard to make out his body, his short, stubby legs, and even have a few stars left over for a tail. Now, I will tell you that some people see Sirius as a jewel on the dog's collar instead of his nose. I still like the nose better. Canis Major is mostly seen as one of Orion's hunting dogs. But there are other legends about the dog. Remember when we talked about certain stars rising or setting, serving as guides to ancient cultures about the seasons? The rising of Sirius in the east was of such great importance to the early Egyptians because it signaled the annual rising of the River Nile. Have you ever heard the term the dog days of summer to represent the last few weeks of summer? Well, that's when Sirius first appears in the eastern sky, about that time of year. The other thing about Sirius is that it is the brightest star in the night sky. No other star is brighter. So here's your one and only quiz for this whole series. If someone asks you, what is the, name, what is the brightest star in the sky? What would you say? If you just said Sirius, congratulations. You're wrong. <laughs> I know some of you are yelling at me now that I just said Sirius was the brightest star, so what gives? Well, it was a bit of a trick question. If you remember, in an earlier episode, I told you that our sun is a star. So if someone asks you what's the brightest star in the sky, then the answer has to be the sun. As a matter of fact, some people call it the day star. If someone asks you what's the brightest star in the night sky, then the answer is Sirius. Up above Sirius is another bright star, Procyon. With the stars Betelgeuse, Rigel, and Sirius, Procyon forms a sort of lopsided diamond shape. 
Procyon sits in the constellation of Canis Minor, the little dog. This is one of those constellations that contain many fairly dim stars, so the dog is pretty hard to make out. Like Canis Major, there are many myths and legends about the little dog. Most people just assume he's another of Orion's hunting dog because he follows the hunter around the sky. Just to the west of Orion lies the bright star Aldebaran. Aldebaran is part of a V-shaped group of stars that marks the head of Taurus, the bull. It's not hard to make out the bull's head and horns. The body, eh, it's a little vague. This constellation has been seen as a bull for over 4,000 years. The ancient Babylonians and Persians worshipped the bull as a god. Riding on the bull's back is a cluster of brilliant blue stars known as the Pleiades, sometimes called the Seven Sisters. Depending upon the darkness of your sky and how good your eyesight is, you might see five, six, or seven, and maybe even eight stars here. Almost every culture on Earth for thousands of years has been fascinated by these jewels of the night. To the Greeks, they represented the seven sisters of Zeus. Early Arab astronomers saw them as seven camels. Even Native American tribes saw them as seven young maidens, or in at least one case, seven young boys. One native legend says that seven boys had built themselves new drums and were singing, drumming, and dancing all around the village. One of the boys' mothers stopped them and told them that she had had enough. If you boys want to continue making noise, why don't you go far enough away from the village so that I don't have to listen to it anymore? Well, the boys packed up their drums, left the village, and hiked up to the top of a nearby mountain where they could dance in peace. They danced around in a circle, beating their drums faster and faster and faster until they rose up into the sky and became the stars of the Pleiades. The moral of this story for you parents is to be careful what you tell your children to do. Those boys went far enough away so that mama didn't have to listen to them anymore. To the east and north of Orion lie two bright stars, so much alike that they could almost be twins. And in fact, they are. They are the stars Pollux and Castor. And the constellation is Gemini, the twins. Like many stories in Greek mythology, this one sounds strange to our ears. While Castor and Pollux were considered to be twins, there was one way they were very different. Pollux was immortal. He couldn't die. His twin Castor, however, was mortal. When Castor was killed in battle, Pollux begged the gods to bring him back to life. The gods refused but they did place the pair into the night sky so that Pollux could always be with his beloved brother. The twins are represented by two lines of stars that trail across the sky from the two bright stars. To the west of Gemini lies the bright star Capella and the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. There are many legends about Auriga. In one, he drove Zeus's chariot. The bright star Capella is the sixth brightest star in the sky and is said to represent a goat. Auriga stole the goat from Zeus along with several of its kids and slung them across his back. To escape Zeus, he climbed up into the sky. Just below Capella are several dim stars that are known as the kids. There are several smaller constellations that can be seen in the winter sky. I'm going to leave them for you to discover on your own. Oh, I, I almost forgot the unicorn. Wow. Right in the middle of the triangle, formed by Procyon, Betelgeuse, and Sirius, lies the dim constellation of Monoceros, the unicorn. I've never been able to see much of anything resembling a unicorn here, though. The constellation was first described in the 16th century, so there's not a lot of mythology beyond the fact of unicorns in general and their magical powers. 
In November of 2019, there was a lot of excitement about a possible new meteor shower coming from the area of the sky, including Monoceros. I set up a camera in my backyard hoping to capture photographs of a few meteors. Sadly, it was not to be. I didn't get any pictures of meteors, but I did get a pretty good shot of this area of the sky through the trees. See if you can pick out Orion from this photo. Long exposure photography brings out a lot of stars that can't be seen by the unaided eye, so it might be a bit difficult. I think you'll find it, though. Look for those three stars in a row we talked about. You can even see just a bit of the Orion Nebula in this photograph. In the next episode, we will look at the constellations of spring. The lion roars. See you then, and remember, keep looking up.